Okay, so what I wanted to do in today's lecture is just give you some practical advice that you can actually start doing things a little bit differently in your life to make yourself a bit more secure so that you are doing things um, that aren't stupid. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, you're, you're doing things that make sense from a security point of view. You guys, a lot of you are interested in security. You'll be doing more and more of this uh, as you go on and by the end of your degree. All this stuff will be like, oh, I can't believe you wasted his time telling us about this. But some of this stuff you might not already be doing. Some of you aren't studying forensics and security specifically. So this stuff is going to be particularly interesting to you going forward in your life. Stuff that you can actually just start doing right now to make yourself more secure and start doing things in a um, less risky way on, online. So, most exciting topic in the world not really, uh, is passwords. Most of you use passwords. How, oh, okay. <coughs> okay. Um, can I see a show of hands if you... you oh, you're not going to want to put your hands up for this. Do you... Yeah, okay. <laughs> Everyone put their hands up, please. Everyone put your hands up. You can lower your hand if you use a completely different password for everything that you do online. All right, fine. So no, leave your hands up, please, please. Now, so that's most of you still remaining. What You can lower your hand if you use a different password for everything, but are quite a similar, but in some ways different. All right, so the guys with your hands still up, I won't keep asking questions, but it's time for you to reconsider how you're doing passwords. So. It is quite common, and I, I, you know, sorry to put you on the spot like that. It's not unusual. You guys, most of you are studying forensics and security, right? So most of you are aware, a lot more aware of this than than um, general public. That it's important not to reuse the same passwords. Um, but if you, um, I think most people would use the same passwords. Some people just have two tiers. So things that are super important, like your banking, you'd have this password. And for everything that doesn't matter, you might have some other password. But the question is, uh, so how many of you do that? I'll just say a show of, if you, yeah, putting you on the spot again. So there's a few of you, right? So how do you classify Amazon? Is that low risk or high risk? You don't have to answer that. But you got your credit card details. People can make purchases. One click buying. Right? One click buying. Yeah. So there's there's all sorts of sorts of things related to that. Um, what do you guys think is the most important password that you have? Yeah, that's what I was fishing for. Did you, was it? Yeah, email. So email is incredibly important because it's like this one thing. If you can get someone's email password, just reset everything else basically. So it's like the the keys to your kingdom is your email account which is hilarious because email is hideously broken in terms of security, but we'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, passwords are really important. Um, but it's, it's really hard to do passwords well. You know, just coming up with different passwords that you use for different things. Um, before I flick to the slide where I've got some actual suggestions, do you guys feed back to me what are some ways that you can do this well? Some tips that you might want to give to other people in the class. Words that make sense. Sorry, words that don't make sense, yeah. such as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Yeah, like a sentence or something that um, has terrible grammar or something in it. Sentence with the, bad grammar. Using the letter e, use the dollar sign and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Except that is good. Sentences is a good idea because the longer your password is, it does make it much harder to crack. But if you just have the word password and you change the A to a 4, that's not a good password because most password crackers will try that automatically. So they'll get the English dictionary, they'll try various combinations of words, they'll swap out like an E for a three, A for a four, you know, all those sorts of things, dollar sign for an S and things like that. So that that's, will be one of the first things that a password cracker will try. Uh, so, but if you do that with a long sentence, then that would, could be quite good, especially if the sentence is a bit unusual. That That can be good. Yeah, any other suggestions? Password manager, was that Aiden? Yeah. So, yes, password manager are amazing tools. Uh, so, a password manager will help you basically 
you can use one password to get into your password manager and it stores all of the passwords that you use for everything else. Um, and it can often generate random passwords for you um, so that you basically the software can help you manage your life of all these passwords you're supposed to remember. Every website you go to, you can generate a new random password for. So when you're doing your um, Amazon account, will have a completely random, long, good password and your um, I don't know, your Google account will have another good password and you know, whatever other services you use online have like, it can help make that a lot easier. Um, yeah, any other suggestions? Yeah, yeah, so anything that can randomly generate a password is really good. But then again, really hard to remember. So if you don't have a password manager, and some people find it difficult to use a password manager because you might have mobile devices, you've got all these different computers that you use, and if you basically just jump on someone else's computer, you might not know what your password is unless you've got it installed on your phone or something. Yeah? If you use a password generator or something, just logging that password is a bit of a mess, but if you, yeah. if you accept the password from the password generator, what's to say that they have to start that password somewhere else? Right, but yeah, so you shouldn't use an online password generator. There is a website called, I think it was actually posted to one of the Facebook groups where someone posted this um, link and it randomly generates passwords where he's like, whoa, no, I would not go onto a website that gives me a random password. Like, that seems like a horrible idea. Um, but you can get software you run locally that you can like order the source code of and you can be um, sure that it actually is a good pseudo random number generator that is cryptographically secure and you know all those sorts of things so you want a high quality random thing if you are using password manager other things you can tips and techniques you can use uh, so obviously the longer your password is the better because the, the key space is bigger they have to try if someone's trying to guess your password they need to try more different combinations of letters or words if it's longer um, if you can include unusual characters or symbols is better because a lot of password uh, crackers will obviously try English words and then they'll try letters and numbers first. They're probably not even going to try like special characters uh, until much later on so it can you know that makes a big difference. Um, so you know including uh, you can use new, uh, mnemonics so you can have a password like this is a password but it's quite easy to remember. If you use the first letter from that sentence, first letter from each word in that sentence, you basically have this random string of letters. This is a secure password but is quite easy to remember. It's an 11 character long password which is quite easy and it's fairly random. It'd be better if it had, so you've replaced the, number, the, the, the word 2 with the number 2 um, and it would be even better if you had capitalization and stuff. But these um, passwords, like lots of things, your wallets, they only have one password to get into it. Though. Yes. So what happens if how are later attached? Well, just as easy as anything else. But if you got, if you have to have a good password, at least then you only need to have one really good password. So if you've got a password manager, you need to come up with one really good password to get into it. Uh, and that's all. So you don't need to come up with an, a really good password for every individual thing because it does that for you. Yeah, like uh, say I've got one on my phone right now. I've got to repeatedly put like, and every time I want to tell a lock them up, yeah. I've got to put this long password in that and it's heightened the risk of it being detected by someone else, I suppose. True. Um, yeah. it, and then that gives them access to literally everything, every account. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can, um, a lot of them will have timeouts and things so you don't have to continually enter it in. It'll just be if you you could if it was on your computer for example you can set it so that if you if your computer is inactive for an hour then you need to type in the real and password to start using it or something you know how whatever your risk assessment is for your own computer you can set it however you like um, if you want it to have to do the real and password every time you use it is kind of like it is hard to use but they don't it's not the only option um, so let's see what else I put on the slide so yeah high entropy. So entropy is like the amount of randomness. So higher entropy is a better password. Um, don't reuse the same password. Um, and multi-factor authentication is really uh, good. So for example, I've got a UBK on the key ring, which is like that thing there on the slide. And um, essentially, you can use that for one-time passwords. So some services, you can basically plug it in, press the button. It uses a different password every single time. And you can use it as multi-factor authentication so that you need a password plus this. So for example, if you're paranoid about your password manager, 
you can require this plus your password. So if someone did steal your phone and they managed to watch you type it in, but they didn't have your one-time, you know, thing, your one-time um, authentication token, then they wouldn't be able to get into your password list without it. Um, so you can also, in addition to this thing, you can just install an app on your phone like Google Authenticator, um, which a lot of websites have support for. So if you're using Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, I think, there's a whole bunch of different websites that have support for, for that. So you can create, install your, I think my watch even has Google Authenticator so in it. I, I don't use it, but so you, in, in on my watch. But it, you can set up, for example, uh, so that every time you log into Facebook, you need to type in um, the output from this app. So you just open the app up, and it's got the Facebook code, which changes every however long. Uh, and you just enter that code into Facebook, and then if anyone finds out your password, unless they also steal your phone, they can't get into your Facebook account, um, or your watch, or wherever you've installed it, whatever you've installed it on. Um, so, um, so that's worth doing. Also, some, some services will basically give you the option to receive an SMS. So that's another way of doing one-time authentication. How many of you guys already do that for something, where you receive an SMS whenever you try and do something? What was that for? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So whenever you log into it, they send you an SMS. My In Australia, the bank I was with, they had an option that they send an SMS to approve uh, transactions. Here in the UK, they even go to a step further, and they almost always give you an authentication token that you need to actually type something in. But it's the same kind of um, concept. So you've got multiple layers of authentication in order to do something. Um, yeah. So... Moving on, privacy. It's quite hard to actually control the information about yourself that you share. I mean, in this age, it is anyway. It used to be easy. You just, you know, your default state would be private, and then you would do things to share. Whereas now, it seems more and more people just share by default, and then you have to actually think about things that you're going to not share, almost. It's, it feels like some people will post on Facebook Maybe you are one of them when you basically every day you've got a photo album of things that you did that day and what you had for breakfast and where you had lunch and, um, you know, and <clears throat> that's fine if that's what you want to do. Uh, there are, we will talk about why privacy is important uh, next year uh, in a, have that actual ethical discussion about whether or not we need privacy. But just now, what if you do want to have some privacy, what can you do about it? So we'll just talk about it in a practical point of view now. So lots of websites actually track pretty much everything you do. So for example, Facebook um, knows a lot about you. <laughs> Let's face it. Um, not only what you do on Facebook, but what you do outside of Facebook, because any website that has the Facebook like button is tracking your viewing of that website, whether or not you click the button. Um, as long as you're, if you're logged into Facebook, then Facebook, or maybe even if you're not logged in, because the cookie's still there, um, Facebook can track all of the websites that you're visiting that might not even have anything to do with Facebook. And Google, you don't even have to say about Google, they know, they, they track a lot. So what can you do about it? Um, what, well, open up to you guys, yeah. Don't use Google. Don't use Google, do you mean the website, Google, or? The search. The search, don't use Google search. What's an alternative? Uh, Ask Jeeves. Dogpile? What era are we in? Yeah, what was it? I think I had another one. Yeah, DuckDuckGo is really good. Um, alternative to Facebook. Uh, sorry. Uh, Google. Sorry? Yeah, Tor. So, yeah, so DuckDuckGo is an alternative to, to Google. It um, Specifically, they say they don't track anything. And, um, yeah, so that's an option. Tor is another good thing. Good option that we'll talk about in a minute in some more detail. Yeah. Sorry? Clear cookies? Yeah? How would you do that? Right. So, yeah, in Firefox, you can clear your history. So, you can say, look, clear everything that happened in the last hour or whatever. Yeah. So, an example of that that they use on the Facebook website, because there's like, there's obviously, um, they, could, they could use all sorts of interesting examples, but the example they use on the Facebook website is what if you're shopping for an engagement ring, for example? You don't want 
for someone that comes across on the computer later to see the search history and everything that's happened on that computer. Oh, there's a, you know, oh, it's like, no, it wasn't, you know, whatever. Um, so that's the example of Facebook users. Um, what about do not track button? Do not track, yeah. So um, web browsers, uh, so actually, just, um, yeah, so do not track is a um, header that gets sent out on requests. And it, you can configure your browser to tell the website not to track you. Uh, show of hands if you think that webs if you think that a website is likely to actually pay attention to that um, instruction. <laughs> yeah, um, some do half-heartedly, maybe not track you quite as much, but. Um, there was controversy over when this thing was introduced. Obviously, most a lot of really big corporations make money off advertising, so they want to track everything they're doing. Um, Microsoft, when they released the first version of IE, Internet Explorer, that included Do Not Track, by default, it would send Do Not Track, so you didn't even have to turn it on. So then all the websites are like, well, I'm not going to pay attention to this Do Not Track thing if it's just everyone's got it by default. So then, basically, most of the websites don't pay attention to it anyway, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of it. And in fact, by saying you don't want to be tracked, if anything, is going to like make people more interested in you. Um, but you can you can go into um, you know most web browsers, you can turn that on or off. Um, but it's basically useless. Um, going back to the clearing cookies, can anyone think of another way that they can like use a web browser without storing? All the information about what you're doing. There's usually a privacy mode. So in like Firefox, you can hit Control uh, Shift P, and in Chrome, you do Control Shift N, um, and it'll open up incognito or privacy mode or whatever it's called. Um, so say for example, a student comes into your office, and you want, and they want to log into like all their accounts for some reason because they store everything in the cloud instead of on a USB stick, then you can just open up like a new thing and then they, they can just do their stuff in there and you close the window and you're not like still logged into it all and um, you know have to worry about anything like that. So yeah, it is, it is um, very useful. Uh, anything else? I think I've got some more things on the slides, so yeah. VPN. VPN, yes, good. I'll talk about that in, in a second. Yes. Yeah, so you can get extensions for web browsers that will actually uh, block tracking cookies and things without blocking everything else. So you can um, block either the, the actual tracking that happens um, and you know ad blockers, obviously, to stop adverts uh, popping up, um, taking up your screen real estate. Interesting ethical questions behind that. There's the um, who's watching me, Richard. Yeah. Who's watching me? I'm not sure. There's another one that does something similar called Ghostery, um, and that is a similar thing. I think it actually does it stop. Yeah, it stops tracking, but also shows you how many like things are trying to track you at the moment. Interestingly, they're funded by the same people that are trying to track you. It's this really interesting um, thing there. They 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 do stop them for. You know, they do stop the tracking cookies, but they're funded by the people trying to track you uh, because they provide information, anonymous information about how many people blocked which cookies and things back to the um, to the same companies and get paid to do that. So it's, it's quite interesting, but it, it works. Um, uh, I think I've got Ghostery installed on some devices. So um, technical solutions. So, you know, on the most basic level, check what your privacy settings are. Have you seen these things? You can knit one for yourself if you like, so that you can go on the internet while you're in an airport without everyone watching what you're doing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, yeah, do you want to say that? Yeah, so they, they, I don't know what it's called. Mm. Yeah, there's like a piece of film on the front of the screen. If you rip that off and then put put that on sunglasses, then only only you can see the screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you can get, yeah, you can basically modify your screen so that you can't see it unless you're looking through glasses, yeah. Um, you know, because you don't, just say, you've, like, even if you're just going on Facebook or something, you don't really want everyone around you seeing exactly what you're doing. Um, 
So, but just look at security settings. Like, for example, if you use WhatsApp, which which I don't use, but there's so okay, I shouldn't say that. How many of you guys use WhatsApp? Show of hands. A lot of you, right? So probably half. Um, how many of you checked uh, or changed your privacy settings on WhatsApp? Show of hands. Yeah. Okay. So the re most of you, um, almost half of you, half of the people here. Uh, have shared a whole bunch of stuff to everyone that wants to look at it. Maybe you don't realize that things are shared with not just the people that you're friends with or whatever it's called on WhatsApp. So the, by default, the permissions, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was there was a news story about WhatsApp um, a couple of weeks ago um, that there was some security problems um, in the things that are shared, even when you set things to be hidden. But also there's just quite a lot shared. But it's not just WhatsApp. In, on Facebook, there was a news story just um, this semester about someone who posted to their own Facebook page. Uh, so I think you, you may have heard this story. So there's this, um, it, was, it was this lady who basically just took silly photos of doing whatever the sign said not to do. So, and who hasn't done that? So, you know, uh, I, I think in high school, I remember taking a photo of a friend smoking under a non, no smoking sign, whatever. Smoking's bad, you shouldn't do it. But um, but but if you um, you know and like you know doing standing on the grass and all those sorts of things. But one of the photos was um, like a be respectful in a cemetery sign, and she was just like do it, you know pulling a finger and screaming basically, and that was what the photo was. It got the media media attention somehow, so she po po posted on her Facebook page or the person who po took the photo put it on their Facebook group and it, they thought that it was just their friends that could see it but it turns out it was a public listed publicly and uh, kind of it made its way into the media and she lost her job over it basically over this photo um, because it you know it turns out the cemetery was about war veterans and then it became this whole thing about um, you know not showing respect for the people you know she had a job that you know, you wouldn't, the, the argument was you wouldn't want someone who's disrespectful to war veterans to work in a job like this kind of thing. And so it, it became this whole thing and now she's got this new job and she is worried that one day they're going to stumble across all these news articles about her um, and she might lose a job again. So yeah, think about your privacy settings, long story short. So there are technical solutions. We talk about do not track, we talk about blocking cookies, we talk about blocking advertising. Uh, blocking tracking, and um, you mentioned some of the specific things there. Um, you you can also use something called Track Me Not, which generates false traffic. So it, it basically throws a spanner in the works in that, you know, they're trying to track what you're doing, but it will make it look like you're just doing all sorts of stuff. So it makes it hard for them to basically figure out what's true and what's not about yourself. Um, and, you know, there's obviously the question of if their business model is relying on all this stuff and they're providing services to you for free because of this stuff, is it okay to use these? Yeah. Um, there's a service from PDFF called Panopticlick. Um, Panopticlick. 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 Yeah. By um, EFF, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it will basically scan the browser to determine sort of the uniqueness. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So there are ways that they they can basically create a unique signature of you based on you know yeah fonts and all sorts of interesting stuff that's yeah that's a really really interesting point there was a project by hd um hd more from um metasploit one of his early projects was about doing something similar and i think that they the fbi use use those techniques recently to for, for something uh yeah great memory but um yes so it is hard to to, to hide to not be unique, 
there are ways you can do it. If you really care, you could use a live image. So basically like a Linux system that just you wipe at the end. And this, there are there is stuff you can do. OK, so this came up, VPNs and Tor and everything like that. So you can use anonymizing services. Um, so if you use a VPN, um, someone say, tell me what a VPN is. VPN is like a virtual private network. It's like a yep. server somewhere. That changes your IP address to that, to that server's IP address. Yes, yeah. So basically, you access, you do all your internet stuff via this VPN, and you know you can set up your own VPN easily, so that you know you can route your traffic between your networks that you have control over. But you can also pay a third party to host to basically <coughs> you can access the internet via their VPN. There are some security concerns that you should think about before you do this. The main question you have to ask yourself is whether you trust them. So they obviously know, probably know your identity, although you could pay in Bitcoin or something like that and stay rant, sort of anonymous. And there are different VPNs will have different um, um, policies. Some will actually say up front they don't keep any logs of who's connecting to which IP addresses. Um, so that can be, um, could potentially be very, uh, do very, well at keeping anonymous as long as um, obviously if you were going to be committing massive crimes then that wouldn't be probably um, you know if you were murdering people they would be able to kick down the door of the people that do the VPN and um, potentially figure out the next time you try and connect to it but for most people it's going to provide a pretty good level of uh, anonymity for just your general use Unless the VPN is in the run. yeah yeah. Okay. Um, so that, but obviously they can see all the traffic entering and leaving the systems. Um, but it's just a question of how much, whether you trust them. So Tor is an alternative, but that's even more difficult in terms of whether you trust them. Um, for for a reason I'll get into in a minute. Proxies is essentially um, similar kind of thing, except that you're just routing traffic through your proxy service. Um, and it's kind of like a VPN, but it's not all of your internet traffic. It'll just be like a particular service. So your internet browsing, for example. And there are other things like I2P or IIP, depending on how you, the, the invisible internet project, which is kind of similar in um, uh, to Tor in their goals. So this is how Tor works. Because uh, it is worth understanding Tor because it, um, it's probably the most prevalent way of trying to remain anonymous online. So basically, you've got Alice and trying to talk to Bob. Alice's talk client picks a random path to destination server and um, basically encrypts the information. It's kind of gets, it's called the onion um, router because it, it layers the encryption so that you can't, basically, no one along the path can see what the next steps along the path are. But so sends it through, encrypts, it's basically layers of encryption. You can see it gets encrypted all the way through to the exit node. So the actual exit node in this case is the one next to Bob. The exit nodes can be run by random people. You can start your own exit node. But the, the actual connection from the exit node to Bob is unencrypted. So the exit node can see everything that you're doing. So if you're not using encrypted traffic to Bob, like all the way to Bob, so, for example, if you're using HTTPS, so an encrypted like web browsing session, or using SSH, then that's still secure. But if you are using just an un unencrypted thing, just browsing um, uh, like the internet, for example, the exit node is going to be able to see everything that you're doing. So Tor, and obviously, if you're logged into Facebook, they'll be able to see your Facebook cookies, and they'll be able to identify you. So, yeah. Unless you can use HTTPS everywhere in your yeah, so that will help, but not every website has HTTPS. So there are websites that won't even have like encrypted connection as an option because you do have to, as a website owner, there are free certs available, but it's kind of like they hosting providers make it a bit difficult for you to use them. They try and get you to pay for the extra feature of allowing encryption. So a lot of websites don't have that. Most of the main ones like Google and Facebook and Twitter, I think now, for the last year or two, do have the, that option. Uh, so yeah, HTTPS everywhere is uh, also from EFF. 
is a, I think it's an extension for, fa for um, Firefox that tries to force every website to use encrypted connections where possible. Uh, so yeah, also a really good thing to install. Anyway, that's how Tor works. So just as long as you're aware, there's more people that you need to trust for Tor than there is with a VPN. Um, yeah, because all the exit nodes. So, God, this lecture is taking a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> um, so, that's fine. So, data in the cloud. So, if you store, how many of you guys actually store lots of stuff on a cloud service, like, you know, Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that? Shotgun, put your hand up high. So, on, surely all of you use it quite a lot. Yeah, go on. Put your hand up if you use Google Drive or, or, or yeah, okay. I'm surprised there's not more of you. So that for those of you guys that have your hand up, uh, how many of you encrypt everything before you put it onto the cloud? Hey, there's one person. So, um, okay, so that's basically a good option if you're, if you're worried about um, trying to keep things secure. It's like an extra level. Uh, so recently the question came up relatively publicly of, a random um, Facebook employee, how much access do they have to a random person's information and files? Well, they didn't give a straight answer. So the, the kind of suspicion is that most Facebook employees could actually basically just read anyone's private Facebook stuff. You know, we do, I mean, we don't really know. But the same thing goes for, for Google and Dropbox and things like that. Like it, we, there is a chance that at some point these services will be compromised and when that does happen, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff there. So what you can do to make yourself more secure is encrypt stuff first. So encrypt things on your computer. So um, it, the easiest way of doing that would probably just be using zip. So whatever program you're using to zip files usually has an, as a password feature. And usually that'll be using like AES encryption or something. So that's the easiest way. If you just want to encrypt something, you like zip it and type in a password. Probably, you might want to check, but probably that's going to mean that's going to be securely encrypted and you can store it somewhere and it will stay safe. There's lots of other things you can use like TrueCrypt and stuff like that or whatever version of fork of TrueCrypt you want to use. It's a whole other conversation. Um, so Cypher Shed's one option. Um, but also, instead of using Google Drive, you could use a service that actually encrypts everything on your computer first. So then they literally never see any of your data. So if you use Mega, which is, I mean, I personally use use Mega, not that I'm endorsing them or anything. Um, Spider Oak uh, is also, is also do the, does the same thing. So that, that it's basically like cloud, it basically works exactly the same thing as Google Drive or Dropbox, except that everything gets encrypted on your own computer before they see it. So they literally, there's no way for them to actually access your files because they don't have the encryption key. They've got no way of getting any stuff. So just as convenient, but more secure. Um, alternatively, you can use something like NKFS. Um, I won't go into details, but it's basically like an encryption layer. You can set it up on your computer so that you just looks like a folder, but it's automatically encrypting everything before it stores it um, wherever. So you can set it up so that you have this folder you just can see all your files, you just use that, but actually what Google Drive is seeing is the encrypted version of it. So you can set all that up to happen automatic, but to be honest, it will probably take you a couple of hours to get it up and working. Um, but once you've done that, you know. So uh, what about the fact that people have physical access to computers? So if we're talking about your home computers, probably you don't really think about it because, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, computers are designed so that you have multiple user accounts so that every user on the computer has a separate account. It's a good idea to do that, if anything else, so that your um, <coughs> other people in your house aren't changing your desktop background and stuff like that. Yeah? I, have, I actually have an admin account and then a, just a user account with no rights at all. Yes. So I break that user account and get a crappy virus. I just log yeah. into the administrator account and delete it. Good, perfect. That's what you should do. You should never be logging in as a. Uh, I've got that on the slide. You should never log in to a graphical interface with an administrator account. It's just a bad idea. So you should have an administrator account which is separate to your normal user account that you log in with. 
Um, and most operating systems kind of do that already nowadays. So, um, if, and just like just basic things, I think about it. If you are sitting in a shared office and you're going to walk away from your computer, lock the screen. Like it's not that hard. If you're in Windows, it's like the super key or the Microsoft logo key, and then L. Yeah, it's locked. You have to password in to get back into it. Or if you're on a Linux system, it's usually Control Alt L, and it'll just lock the screen. You have to type in your password again to get into it. It's a good idea, um, especially if. Um, you know, you need to go to the bathroom or something and there are other people around and you're logged into Facebook and all of your other things and you leave the computer, bad things can happen if you don't log out uh, or at least lock the screen. So, and on that topic, just encrypt everything everywhere. Why not? It's not hard. Um, so, just for example, this device here. Not going on. Uh, So this device, it's hardware encryption. So you know, if, if say this got stolen, it would be bad. But um, but they wouldn't be able to access anything on it because they need the code to actually be able to mount the hard drive, and it's got hardware encryption built into the hardware. Um, not only that, but there's also a separate partition that has software encryption, which is better because obviously there's a limited, you know, the part the password. You can have a better password for software encryption than having to type a number in. Because uh, to type a really good one, it would be quite long. Um, but yeah, so that just those sorts of things. So the, the convenience of this is obviously I use Linux for almost everything. Um, but now that TrueCrypt is more difficult to use, um, it's it means that if you're swapping between Windows and Linux systems, you, you know you have to have software installed and stuff to be able to access things. Whereas with this, I just type in code. And there are USB sticks that have similar things where you've got a code that you have to just type into the USB stick. And then you, then it works, and you just can't access it unless you've got the code. So there's something to think about. Um, you know, they're not super cheap, but they are. They they're potentially worth it because you know if you've got your assignments and whatever other things you've got stored on USB, you know, for example, we've had plagiarism cases where people have basically been in trouble for collusion because their assignment ended up being the same as someone else, and they claim they just left their USB behind, and someone got a copy of their assignment from their USB. Uh, you don't really want to be dragged into those kinds of meetings if you can help it. Um, software encryption is nice. Um, think about your webcams and microphones and things that are plugged into your devices. Uh, your computer could be watching you. Uh, so, for example, some of the exercises that we do uh, with Metasploit, for example, we hack into a computer. And at that point, you can start listening in on microphones. You can... Um, Oh, you've even already done it in this this module. The very very first week when you're playing around with Trojan horses, there's things where you can like um, listen in on microphones and take pictures of webcams and things like that. So yeah, think about it. Uh, so there's software vulnerabilities. So if you use Windows, install Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, which basically just adds extra protections to stop kinds of buffer overflows and things like that. Um, you should run software that you're not sure about in sandboxes, so you can use software like Sandboxy, um, and don't install software you don't trust. Email is insecure, and everything's insecure basically. Make sure you're using HTTPS, and check for secure connections and certificates. So I think the last thing I want to say is if you're on a website, the the kind of like the thing that we've been saying for years is check for the little lock. But check it's in the place it's supposed to be in, and just not just like the, you know, they haven't just set the favicon for the website to be a lock because people fall for that trick. But um, you know, the lock's where it's supposed to be, and it nowadays it's color coded. So if it's they have different levels of authentication. So if you're on banking, for example, the whole section of that will usually be like green, and you click on that, you can say they've got like extended domain like validation. So um, there are different levels of how much they do checking. Uh, when they issue certificates. Um, so just check that stuff. Make sure that you are on the website you think you're on. And that's all I'm going to say for now. I hope that that has given you some little tips that you can use um, in your life online. And um, see you later. Thanks, guys.